Thank you. So my name is Lori Steffen, and I currently own the four offices, which are a franchise of Real Estate One. Uh, I own the offices in Alpena, Hubbard Lake, Ascoda, and East Tawa. So we kind of take care of the whole shoreline. So we get a little bit of all year residential in a lot of our seasonal things, more so in the Ascoda Tawas area. I have been selling real estate for 30 years. So it's, it's not something that is uh, just a whim. I've been doing it for quite a while and have had my own office for 15 years. So we've been in downtown Alpena since 2007. And we opened the downtown office at the height of the real estate crash. And there goes Zillow calling me right now. So we're just going to put them on ignore. Um, so at the height of the real estate crash, we decided to open a real estate office. Uh, I remember going to the bank and saying, you know, I need a loan to open a real estate office. And they were like, I can't believe you want to open a real estate office. Nobody's buying houses right now. Then it was a buyer's market or seller's. No, take that back. It was a seller's market. No, buyer's market. Sorry, I'm getting myself confused. It was a buyer's market because there were more people that wanted to sell houses and not enough people that wanted to buy them. So buyers got a really good deal. We were dealing with a lot of foreclosures. Um, that was, you know, auctions. People were getting houses that are really good value at that point. So now fast forward 30 years later, I'm still in business. Well, not 30 years from then, 15 years from then, but, and now, as you know, it's about the real estate market is about as hot now as it is outside right now. <laughs> we had um, probably starting um, at really at the beginning of COVID and I hate to call COVID a thing, but it, it is. And that's when our market changed. So at the beginning of COVID, when we got shut down, we were part of the market that we were told we couldn't go to work. And so both you know, my husband's here today too. We were both, all we do is real estate. And we're like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? We're not going to survive. You know, this is our only income. What's going to happen? And so I got to admit the first couple of weeks, it's kind of nice not being, having to leave my house. And I kind of thought, oh, this is kind of cool. So then fast forward when we got to go back to work and we were told, okay, the real estate market's open again under these conditions. My phone was literally on my island and I just watched it vibrate right off of the table because as soon as people knew that they could go and look at houses, we, we just never stopped from that point. The real estate market, their prices went up, I would say at least... I was going to say 17% the first year and last year it was 20%. So a house that we normally maybe would have sold, you know, for 120. Now, if you put that same house on the market, you're probably looking at 149. And so it's a good time if you're thinking about selling to sell, because you're going to be getting the most dollars for your house than you've seen in a long time. And a lot of people keep saying, When's it going to crash? And it's like, it's not going to crash, at least not anytime really soon. We just came from a seminar with our franchise offices and they are predicting, are predicting a 3% hike in prices for 2023. So if you're thinking of buying, you also don't want to wait because you're going to pay a little bit more next year than you're going to pay this year. It's, it's basically a supply in demand and what we're finding is that back then everybody moved out of Alpena. They all went downstate or out of, out of state to raise their families, get their higher paying jobs, whatever it may be. And then when COVID happened and their bosses were all like, okay, you can work from home. It didn't take long for people to realize if I'm going to work from home, I'm going to live where I want to live and not in the craziness of, you know, Metro Detroit or Grand Rapids. Those are all great areas, but they wanted to be close to family. They wanted the woods and the water. So then they started coming up here and a lot of them are getting the same pay as they are from, you know, being in those bigger areas. So they have more buying power. So that's what's kind of causing the prices to go up. And we're seeing a ton of cash offers. So those are, those are coming in regularly. And the market 
is so crazy that yesterday I just listed a house in my old neighborhood. We got an offer on it right away for asking price. And my sellers last night were like, let's sign it. Let's sign it. Let's sign it. And I'm like, no, we have till noon tomorrow. We're going to hold out. They're like, no, we just want to sign it. And I'm like, no, we need to hold out. Last night while I was sleeping, another agent was writing an offer on my listing. So I saw it, it came in when I woke up this morning at 11.56 p.m. last night. She was writing an offer and that offer ended up being $20,000 over asking. So then I called my seller this morning. I'm like, how'd you sleep last night? And she's like, oh, we're kind of nervous. And I said, hey, I'm going to rock your world. I said, I just got you $20,000 more on your house this morning. And that's the kind of market that we're in. So in order for buyers to do that, that you, you know, you really need to have a good buyer's agent working for you. So a buyer's agent doesn't cost the buyer any money. They work on behalf of the buyer. The commission is still paid from the transaction. So technically the seller's paying the commission, but the buyer is too, because they're up in that offer enough to cover all of those expenses. So a good buyer's agent is going to know all the right tools in the wording to put in your contracts in order to get your offer to win. Because before it used to be, my job is to get the buyer the best price and the best terms. Now my job has changed and my job is to get the buyer the house that they want. So that might mean putting in an escalation clause. And that's kind of new to our market. And an escalation clause is when you make an offer on your house and you say, okay, Mr. or Mrs. Seller, I'm gonna offer you 180,000 for your house. However, I will pay $2,000 over your highest net offer, not to exceed 200,000. So then, if the seller gets multiple offers, they know that my buyer will beat any of those offer, other offers by $2,000, but we won't go over this cap. So we put a cap on that. Does anybody have any questions on any of that so far? Oh, okay, I see you're taking notes, so that's good. So the other thing we can do in there is an appraisal gap guarantee. So now, you know, with all of the market rapidly changing, uh, we're finding that buyers are offering sometimes more maybe than that house is worth, but it's worth that to them. So they're setting the new precedent on the current value of that house. I just had one out on Grand Lake. Um, the, my gut on it was probably 475, 480. We listed it, the seller wanted 525. I'm like, that's a little higher than what we thought. We got two offers, both at 525. So seller's really happy. Now we go into waive the home inspection, get into the appraisal. Appraisal comes back at 470. We're like, uh-oh, what do we do now? Now we have a $50,000 gap. My buyers wanted that house. They're paying, they're reworking the whole loan structure so that they're going to be paying 525 for the house even though it only appraised for 470. So that was something I was a little nervous about because I, I don't want to see anybody upside down on a house to start with either. But this was, I mean, they, are, they already had a Christmas tree in the corner. They, they were moved into this house. So that's just another avenue that we're having to utilize to get our offer to win. We'll hear sometimes people will write what we call love letters. We do not participate in those in our office. And what a love letter is, is when the buyer writes a letter to the seller explaining why they think their offer should go to the top of the pile, why they should be the family living in that house. And the reason we don't do that is because of discrimination. So if two people write an offer and you just have to be really careful because of different reasons. You don't want that seller to choose that offer based on things that could be discriminatory. So that's why we don't present them. So some agents are still writing them, but we won't present them in our office. Has anybody here recently listed or, or bought a house? No, oh, well, you're all future clients then. <laughs> oh, you count, yes, you do. I keep, yeah, Linda does, definitely does count. So when we go in and with 
with COVID too, we had to do things a little different because so now, I mean, one of my agents literally sold a house to a gentleman in Belgium yesterday. The person's in Belgium relocating back to Michigan. So how was he going to get here to go look at a house? So Jeff, my agent is, we had to do things a little different. So gets out his iPhone, buyer's got an iPhone, he's got an iPhone. We go on FaceTime now. We take the phone all the way around the house. Okay, this is what the bedrooms look like. Um, this is what the yard looks like. This is what the neighborhood looks like. You know, it's like, oh, go back there. I wanna see that. They, they can't physically be here. So we're having to find different avenues to get those buyers an opportunity to win too. And I kind of did my presentation a little bit on real estate then and now. And so, you know, back when I started, um, when somebody would come to my office and they would want to buy a house, we had, um, I don't know if any of you will remember this from when maybe you bought your house, we had the old MLS books. They came out every two weeks. It was a book about this thick and it had every house that was for sale in it. And we would have to actually go photocopy that page, print it off, put it in an envelope, send it to the buyer and, or sometimes I would drop it off or they would come in and pick it up, whatever the situation would be. And that's how you found out about what houses because the internet wasn't available for public use at that point. This is 1992. So we didn't quite have that in our office yet. So now when somebody says they want to buy a house um, as an agent, we have, this might've just, uh, oops, this has got something with the Zoom meeting. So we have an, um, a program that the agents all belong to, and this is our flex program. So if somebody comes in, let's see if I can make this a little bigger without getting too much into that black spot there. So somebody's gonna come in, they're gonna say, I wanna look for a house. So I just come into my program and I can say, okay, you're looking for a house in Alpena and we only want houses that are active. We don't want to look at anything that already has an offer on it. And let's see, we're gonna say we wanna be 200,000 to 300,000. Oops, I didn't put Alpina in there. So I gotta take that back a little bit. And this will give me everything that's available, which I don't expect it to have a big number there. Four. So if you gave me 200 to $300,000 in cash right now and you wanted to live in Alpina, there are literally four houses for sale. When, when I first opened my office for like the first five years, it was not uncommon for me to carry 110 listings myself. So I had 110 sellers all wanting to sell their house at the same time. Now I think I, think I might have two, maybe one. So mine's, I don't think I even have anything in this price point. So there's this one on Bear Point Road, this one on Lakeview Drive, this one on Long Rapids and oh, that one's mine on the highway and I'm getting an offer on that Friday. So happy for me. So we, this is how we search. And now how times have also changed if we're out in the field and somebody's like, well, what about that house? We have apps for everything now. So without a smartphone, and I remember uh, it was probably like 1999. I remember, I don't know if you remember Shirley Houston. Um, she used to be at Remax, and I remember her calling. She was trying to get a hold of me, and she's like, "Lori, you got to get a cell phone." And I'm like, "Surely, I will never have a cell phone. It is the only time that I have peace and quiet. I have four kids. It's the only time I have quiet is when I'm in my car. Oh my gosh, I know where this is before my dogs, my family members. I know where my where my cell phone is because this is this is my whole my whole office is in here now. But we have all kinds of apps now. We just come into here." We have the same program here as an app on my phone. I can also, every company has their own app. So um, Real Estate One has their own app. So I can come on here and search. It'll tell me, you know, every single house. So if we're standing in a neighborhood and there's like all, it might be hard to see here, but there's like all these little for sale signs on here. And I'm like, oh, so we're standing here and we see that one come up for sale. 
I can click right on here and it's going to give me all of the information. I don't have to be in my office to do that. I'll be out in the field and it will give me everything that's for sale. So it's just, just a whole different way of, of doing things. So we actually have a program in real estate one called first to know. So I take my buyers, I put them in the first to know app and it would, the minute somebody else submits a listing to the MLS, it will text you and then it will email you and say, Hey, Lori's sending you a new listing. And I even like have my own app that I send my clients and it's a Lori Stefan app. And then I send this to a new client. And so they can do all their searching the same as I can on here, because when you're buying a house, you're obsessed with buying a house. You're like, you know, everything that hits Zillow before I do, because you're excited and you want to buy a house. I'm doing 20 other things. So I might miss it the second it comes on. So these apps are really, really handy to have. Um, back in the day too, we would have to find out who owned a property. The only way we got to find out who owned a property was go to a good old plat book, open up the plat book, find the 40 acres, go to the back, find out who owned that piece of property, or we would have to call the, the township or the assessor and find out um, who owns this. App. Now we have an app for that. So we can um, go to an app. And this actually was an app that was uh, first designed. Did you have a question? What is Zillow? Zillow. Um, so Zillow is an entity. They actually have real estate agents. So they're actually licensed real estate agents. So they're basically a website. When I have a listing and I enter it into our MLS, Zillow buys that information and puts it on their site. So, but you don't want to rely on that because the problem right now is because the inventory is so low, there's no reason for buyers to go to Zillow. They've learned that Zillow isn't necessarily correct all the time. It'll show active, but then when the buyer calls me, I'm like, no, that one has a contract on it because it shows that in my MLS. They get angry because it's saying, well, it's, uh, Zillow says it's still for sale. And it's like, so Zillow isn't changing the statuses because if they only had active listings on their site, they'd have four and there'd be no reason to go there. So they're, they're just another website full of, uh, you know, listings. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. I forgot about the whole rule. Is that better? We've actually seen them advertise homes that sold years ago just to stimulate phone calls. So, yeah. And, and Zillow, so what happens with real estate agents is we pay money for Zillow to call us, which is really kind of silly because they're, we're, they're calling us on our own information. So if you call on Zillow or you go to Zillow and you say, I want more information, then Zillow puts you on hold. Then they call a real estate agent that has paid to get that phone call. Then they put you on hold. And if you call Zillow, you're going to get Alex. Alex is a robot. He's not real. He sounds real, but he's not real. Um, so that's, that's how Zillow works. But the, um, the app that we have now is Onyx Hunt and it was designed for hunters. So all of the hunters would use this, you know, they could walk their parcels or hunt state land or whatever, and it would help them get into their location. And then there's a little spot on here that you can help walk you back out. But real estate agents caught on to that real quick. And it's like, oh, this is like information in my pocket. So I can go on Onyx Hunt and no matter where I am, I can just click on that it will send me the whole tax card and tell me who owns that piece of property, where their tax bill goes and how much acreage is there. So, and also it's helpful if I'm showing property, which um, usually my husband shows property for me. So he's licensed too. it. You can walk through. And if you're on somebody else's property, you might not know where the boundaries are. So this helps us stay on the correct property. Um, and also back in the day, um, of how we used to do it and how we do it today back in the day was face to face we would you know meet with the clients at the table we would sit down and talk about you know what houses you looked at you know that today that you might want to make an offer nowadays everything is an app and digital so 
we use a program called um, zip forms. And I don't have my zip forms on here, but I can go onto my zip forms. I can do it on my phone and I can do it on my tablet. I can do it at my office. I type in all of the information on all of the forms there, put all of your purchase price, all your contingencies in there. And then I'm going to send it to you electronically. You, most people do have a smartphone or some sort. So you can either open up your phone or you can go to your computer at home and you just tap on it, tap on it, tap on it, tap on it. It signs your name electronically, sends it back to me. I save it on my computer and I forward it on to the other agent in your bank. So everything is done electronically. Um, we don't need to meet face-to-face. -face. I still like to meet face-to-face because -face it's still about relationships. But right now the market's so busy that if I have to wait till you're out of work at four and you're out of work at seven and I have to be over here, you can't be everywhere, but this is, makes it really easy. So I can send it to everybody. You can do it while you're on vacation. Um, it's, there's, no, there's no limits. The only thing you cannot electronically sign yet is a deed. So that still needs to be a wet ink signature and it needs to be notarized. So for a seller, we still, we can email them all their documents, but they're gonna still need to meet in front of a notary. Okay, um, also what's changed from now to then, low ball offers. And so back in, you know, the nineties and 2000, early 2000s, it used to be where a buyer would go and maybe look at, you know, 20 houses and then they would sit down and have coffee and talk about which ones they liked and which ones they didn't like. And, you know, which one were they gonna make an offer on it? Fast forward to 2022, now a seller is looking at 20 offers. There's one buy, one house for sale. So that buyer's like, okay, we'll take it. But there's 20 buyers that are saying, okay, we'll take it. So that buyer, you know, there's 20 offers. Now the seller's the one sitting down with like, okay, which one do we want to take? Because we sit down when we get an offer and we're doing a proceed sheet and we have to put down all of the pluses and minuses of every offer. This one doesn't want a home inspection. So that kind of moves to the top. This one's cash. This one says you can stay for 60 days after closing. I don't, that's not me, I don't think, is it? Okay, I just thought I was doing something. Um, so, you know, it just it's just changed, you know, back to, you know, thinking of how it used to be versus how it is now. I'm not, I didn't get to that part yet. Is it okay? Okay, so I wanted to touch back, going backwards a little bit when we were talking about looking at houses and doing it on FaceTime. I kind of skipped over because we went a little off straight, I guess. Okay, so now we bought this camera here and this is called a Matterport camera. Um, we are the only office in town right now that I believe has their own Matterport camera. There are businesses that will come in and do it for other companies, but we own our own. And this camera, um, my son does all of that. He just goes and you put it in the center of the room and it literally takes tons of slices of photos up, down. Every the only bad thing about it is you have to be prepared as a seller. So I've done them and they're like, my house is a mess. And I'm like, I don't clean your house. You have to clean your own house. So, I mean, it shows every little thing and you can zoom in actually. So I'm going to. Tell you a little bit more about the camera. The camera actually has six lenses on it. So what, what it, it's very, very smart. So when my son sets it up to activate it, it's taking six pictures all at once. It's actually taking the ceiling, it's taking the floor, and then there's four other cameras as it spins around. And what he does is he, he'll take that pic, picture and then he moves the camera to another location and it, moves, it keeps moving through the house. The camera is smart enough to know if something has changed, it won't allow the next picture to be taken. For example, if that camera right now took the picture of this room and then we went and closed that door, it would know that door was closed and it would not allow the next projection to happen until you put it back to the way it was. Um, the camera is very smart. What, what the Metaport camera allows you to do is to utilize it at home on your own computer and for you to walk through that house at your own pace and to look at everything from the ceiling to the floor, 
to the, this is, the I'm just going to show them this. So yeah. when we put this up on the site and we send this to customers, this is what you're going to see. So let me just get this a little bigger here because it's, so that's going to start off with what they call a dollhouse view, which kind of makes you a little dizzy, but um, so that shows you like the floor plan of the house. And then you can literally be here and go and walk all the way around. You can come over here. You'll see like these little circles. Let me see, this is not my computer. So I apologize that it's a little different. You can look out the windows. Let's see. Wherever you see these, that means that's the spot where the camera has done. So I can go into this room, see the kitchen. And so if you were in another country, another city, you're getting a really good idea of the spaces. And what else is nice about this when we just built a house. And so our model home that we built ours from had a matter port on it. So I would go in and figure out where my furniture is going to go. So I can go on this little measuring tool and I can say, well, I wonder if my table will fit here. How big is this table? So I can go here and I can go, okay. Okay, that table's two feet, seven inches. So I know when I'm looking for a furniture, I need to find a table that's gonna fit in that spot. So it's just, just kind of a, a fun program and my sellers love this. And I actually sold a house this year and my seller sent me a message back after we closed because her son was sitting on his iPad and he kept, they had already sold the house and moved on to their next house and he missed his house. So he kept going to the Matterport tour and walking to his old bedroom so that he could still see it. So we try not to keep the, too many of them on because we're only allowed to have so many of these in our vault, so to speak, at a time. So, but I kept that one on there just so Colby can go and visit his bedroom when he wants to. But it gives you like, it's like you're there, you know, you're, this one was uh, in Alpena on State Street. We sold this a couple years ago. But yeah, there's like, it's unlimited. So kind of a, a fun program to be able to utilize. Um, let's see what else. The other thing is uh, print advertising. So back in the day, we used to do a lot of um, print advertising. And we've kind of done away with that now. We maybe do one or two magazines, but the shelf life just isn't there. So by the time you get those magazines printed, somebody picks it up, that house is already sold and somebody else is living in it. So we don't use that as much. Social media has been a huge, huge boost to the real estate business. I can put something on my Facebook and walk away and I'll come back in a half hour and there will be like comment, 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 comment. People are tagging people. It's like, I don't even have to do, do, do that much, but I can post it. Like if I put Linda's old farm on the market right now, we could sell that again to, in, in a heartbeat. You just put it on there and then you're sharing it. And then we can also do things to like boost our ads. So we're kind of becoming a little bit of every industry where before we just had to list and sell houses. Now we have to market, we have to go to Canva, we have to create our own flyers. There's just a lot of extra things that we do, but it's all fun stuff. So um, I, I really enjoy it. It is. It's really, I mean, it, we not, whoever would have thought. I mean, I remember still when I was in high school and I was taking a course and we had this big IBM typewriter and I would type up my letter and then there was a little button on it I could hit repeat and it would type the same letter over and over. And I thought that was like so cool. <laughs> and now, I mean, it's just like the things that are out there, real estate agents, I mean, you really do have to wear a lot of hats. Yeah, I never had a phone in my car. So I only had just, you know, my smartphones or my, my old uh, Blackberry or whatever it was back in the day, but you know, it's, it's just really evolved. And then I sit back and I think, gosh, if I'm learning all of this and doing all of this 30 years later, you know, what are the real estate agents 30 years from now going to be doing? I, I, I mean, is we can do like the virtual goggles if we had them and you could do this, the same program that I have with this camera also adapts to like the 
difference in virtual reality is at the right time. Like I'm going to the young guy in the room, <laughs> the virtual reality. So you can do those and you can actually walk through and touch things with those as well. But it's, it's definitely changed and buyers needs have changed, you know, before it was, you know, they wanted three bedrooms and a family room and maybe a basement. Now it's like, okay, what kind of internet do you have? That's like the first question they ask all the time is you want to be in an area with high speed internet because um, if you don't have high, you have a ghost in the building. If you don't have high speed internet, you know, that's a real detriment and that could make the value of your house go down because so many people are working from home and they need that flex space. So now it's at not even a three bedroom, two bath, it's a two bedroom home office. That's gonna sell faster than advertising it as a three bedroom. Anybody have any questions? No, that's okay, go for it. It doesn't sound like you expect the rise in interest rates to cool the market anytime soon. I don't think it will. I think what it's just going to do is reduce the number of competitive buyers. I think the sellers are still going to get their price for their house and it's still going to sell in a quickly time period. There's just going to be less buyers competing for it. So instead of 20 buyers, maybe now we have five or eight. Oh. Yep. Yeah. I kind of, I kind of do. I don't know. I used to be the HUD broker in our area, and I know the time frame that it takes to go through the HUD foreclosure process. In the houses that were affected, where people didn't make their payments due to COVID, you probably realistically won't see those for another three years. It's just that it, there's so much so much red tape that goes into it and foreclosing on them property and everybody gets one more chance and one more chance. And yeah, so I think, I think they'll come, but I think it'll be a couple years down the road. I'm just starting to get emails again from auction.com. So they're not as many as there used to be. I'd like to know a little bit more about the Hunt property line. My neighbor next door is selling their house. Okay. And I'd like to make sure my property line is very clear to me when they're advertising their house. Okay. So the best way to determine a property line is going to be to get a survey. So th this program will give you, we can't call it a, a, a Bible, so to speak, because this will give, it, it's been known to not be perfect. Um, so this will give you a general idea, but a staked paid survey will be the best option for that. But I would have my description of my property and the number of feet and so forth already. Right. My... But you do, but you, where's the pin where it starts? So you, your legal description might say, you know, 500 by 800, but you have to know where that 500 starts. When a, when a survey is, there's different types of surveys. Um, the survey that would have been done to determine that is going to be driven into the ground and there'll be a surveyor number on top of that. It may be covered up now and you can usually find those with a metal detector, but that's going to be where your boundary starts. So you need to know where the, the, this line is to find out where this one is. What about some people that think that the property is grandfathered in? There's no such thing. I bought my house at one time. The neighbor told me it was there. The, the courts might not make them move that they're going to be reasonable. So we've, we've sold property where we find out later that somebody's living room is in somebody else's front yard <laughs> because in like Piper road, for example, Piper road is like a hot mess. So because one survey started on this side, one surveyor started on this side, like down in Aw Sneak. And so then you have the curvature of the road and then you have the railroad tracks. So they found out that everybody on Piper Road, their lots all went this way when everybody was assuming they went this way. So everybody was building their extra pull barns and everything. And they kind of all just said, 
we're just going to stay in our own where we think our yards are and everything was okay, but it's, you know, that you won't know until you have an actual survey. So you would have to go to file a court order to take any of that property back. And there had, there's like all kinds of things that have to meet that criteria before a judge would give them that piece of property. You're welcome. Yes. Oh yeah, I need your, you need the microphone, I guess. Your first office was on Chisholm Street. That's where I worked. You worked there. Well, my 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 real estate one office is on Chisholm Street right now. Okay. Uh, do you recall a real estate one office on Michigan Beach? Yes, I do. Okay. Did you work there? Yes. I kind of thought you did. I'm like, I know that guy from somewhere. What's your name? Dave Melville. I was like, I I remember that. Yep, that was Lillian Banus's office. Yes. I, I was only in the business for a very short time. I worked at Crest Field Corporation at Grand Lake. Okay. And I was laid off and my union steward told me, Dave, you better get another job. You're never going to get called back to work here. Okay. So that's when I got you know, took the Holloway course and yeah. passed the boards and got my license. And shortly after I got re working for real estate, one, I got called back to work. Oh, so we were a lucky charm for you. <laughs> there for 29 and a half years. So. Yep, that, I actually took my real estate course at that building. So that's where I, I took mine long, long, long time ago. Yes, it was. Anybody else? Is there a particularly hot place in this area, like Presque Hill or Out 32? Um, hot place, what... What goes quickly, obviously, subdivisions are always a, a big draw. Um, and then if you want to be in town, there's an area that real estate agents refer to as the Golden Triangle. And the Golden Triangle is going to take you from the corner of Chisholm Street down State Street all the way to Ripley and back down Washington. So all of the houses in that area are always very desirable. And from there on, it just seems like whatever the buyer wants. I have three buyers right now that will only look in press deal. I just haven't been able to find them anything because there hasn't been anything really out there for them. But I'm finding too that um, most people seem to want no neighbors. So I don't know what happened where people don't want to socialize anymore. I, I, I'm like a very social person. So, I mean, you can ask my husband, we had to reinforce our deck when we were building it last week because the building inspector's like, I know you, you're going to have a lot of parties you need to need to reinforce your deck. I can't imagine living by myself in some acreage. It's just not my thing, but it's still for a lot of people. Anybody else? I guess that's everything then. So I thank you all for coming. I appreciate your time. Thank you.